All right, guys, uh, it's four-ish, so you know, we're going to get started. I uh, appreciate everyone. I want to, uh, we have some new people at the table today. Uh, uh, Mr. Jack Green uh, is uh, our new member. Uh, he'll be filling the vacancy of Mr. Brian Stewart, our former board member. Uh, Jack, if you'd like to maybe say a little something about yourself and introduce yourself to the committee. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jack Green. Uh, currently, I'm working with uh, West Banco Bank here in Columbus, Ohio in the commercial uh, lending area. Um, Columbus resident for a long time, Columbus Public Schools. Um, I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. We're glad to have you as well. Yeah. Appreciate it. And we have our ex-officios. I did talk to Lois. She said she may not be able to come today uh, and have not heard from Debbie. Have you ever gotten a response? Okay. Unless that's great. John, welcome aboard. Appreciate it. This is going to be a fun adventure of finances, school finances. <laughs> so, uh, you know, real quick, I'm going to go over the agenda. We have to be somewhat quick today. Um, you guys are more than welcome to hang out with Stan, uh, but I have to have a hard stop. At around 5 o'clock, we have our continuing our interviews for superintendent tonight, and we're doing those at the Education Service Center. So I'll be going over there, and there will probably be traffic on my way over there. So I just want to make sure, because I was late last night, um, and I don't want that to happen again. Um, so with that on the agenda, uh, we will just look at our minutes real quick. We have our monthly financial report. Uh, and then we'll be getting into our October five-year forecast. As you know, our five-year forecast is a document we produce every two years, looks into our financial health in the next five years, has a lot of assumptions and a lot of different things built in, which Stan will be able to talk about and we'll be able to discuss, uh, getting ready for that. And then as well, our last item on that uh, agenda today is our budget timeline, our various budgets, what we're looking at, personnel budgets, non-personnel budgets, various capital budgets and such. So with that, since we... Uh, do not have a quorum yet. We're going to act as a subcommittee uh, until we go on. Do we have four? Okay. We have four. Okay. I think we're good. Even we have to make sure that, that the uh, we follow the uh, the bylaws of the committee appointments uh, and in those bylaws the president um, appoints. Uh, okay. All so you've members. got three. So That's I apologize. Fine. We have to make sure we do that. That's just a, an oversight. I just want to make sure that we follow our laws. And policies so that when someone tries to abuse it, we can nab for it. <laughs> so uh, we will operate as a subcommittee and we will begin then with the monthly financial report and I'll let Stan take it from there. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is a combined monthly financial report for uh, July and August uh, as we typically do uh, at this time. Um, and what I, there we go. What I'd like to uh, begin with a little bit is to uh, recap what we uh, uh, discussed, I believe, several couple meetings ago about how we're going to prepare the spending plan for uh, fiscal year 19. Um, the, the revenue side is uh, based on the May five-year forecast. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the expenditure side this year, we use the uh, appropriation that we adopted back in June. Uh, it's, uh, that is the end result of all of the budget uh, work that we've, we do. And you'll, that's and later on here when we talk about the budget timeline, you'll see all the steps that we go through to prepare that budget. It is a five-year budget, so it fits very well with our forecast that's coming up later in the agenda. But we do use it for this spending plan uh, in determining month to month how the expenditures will flow. Um, typically, we look at the past five years or so to get the, uh, the monthly patterns uh, smoothed out as best we can. We look for one-offs and anomalies where um, we know it's, uh, for instance, um, uh, certain payments are made in a singular month, but it may vary by a month or two, so we just kind of have to pick one rather than smooth it out. Uh, so you'll see some of that one-month variance occur. But we generally like to try and get it smoothed out so the variances don't, um, uh, they, they represent as little bit of timing as we can um, because we, we're really more concerned about if there are any behavioral changes. Um, however, this year as we've, we've looked at uh, the, uh, the monthly expen expenditure results over the past few years, we've been running under plan on a pretty regular basis. So this year I decided to um, incorporate a little bit of that under plan. In other words, take a little bit of our conservative projection 
out of this plan to perhaps get us a little bit closer to where we'll actually end up, get us a little bit better picture. So you'll see that in this plan we've, de we've developed that. Um, and as I mentioned in our notes, um, that results in a reduction of anywhere from maybe 0.2% which isn't very much in the personnel lines, but it, it ranges all the way up to almost 9% reduction in supplies and materials in terms of what we appropriated versus what we put in this cash flow plan. So just to see if we can um, tweak our, our planning in this, in this regard a, a little bit, um, get a little bit closer. Um, we'll talk later about whether or not that kind of modification carries forward to the five-year forecast. But for now, that's what the plan's based on. Uh, this just simply is a layout of the month to month. As you can see, uh, pretty much the cash balance varies with our, our revenue, which is primarily uh, fluctuates with property tax collections. That's the most uneven collection that we receive. So you, you see that first half, second half uh, cycle. And then uh, on an accumulated year-to-date basis, uh, you'll find that uh, this this spending plan predicts uh, about a $7 million increase in cash balance. So we're bringing in just slightly more than we plan on expending. Um, as you'll see in the forecast, this is the last year that that's being projected to be the case. But we're looking at about $922 million in revenue with $915 million uh, in expenditures for the year. As we get into July and August, uh, the pattern uh, these two months is the pattern that we see quite often, and that is the revenues are running ahead of plan and expenditures are running slightly under plan. I present here both, both months' graph for you. Typically, we'll only look at one, but for this combined month, I'm showing you both. When we get into looking at revenues year to date, um, you can see that um, total revenues so far are about 30 million above plan, and I'll explain what that major variance is because it certainly won't continue to be true. But we're about 30 million uh, favorable uh, year to date, and in August uh, the expenditures came in about 4.7 million under overall. Um, property taxes: we have received the second half settlement. Uh, second, we refer to it as second half because we get them on a calendar year basis. So first half occurs in February, March. Second half occurs in August. And August happens to be the first part of the current fiscal year. So the second half um, uh, property taxes have come in. We are a bit ahead of plan. And I, and I went back and looked to, for an explanation of that variance. And uh, when we estimate property taxes, we do it settlement period by settlement period. So we, we plan on receiving them um, in the, in the settlement period that, that they will occur. Uh, when I went and did the plan, though, I aggregated those dollars into an annual amount and then used the historical spread that occurred in, over time as a way to spread that back out. And, it, and I think that has distorted that a bit, and I probably won't do that in the future. I'll stick with exactly what we say is going to be first half and exactly second half so that we don't allow what's gone on in the past uh, in terms of differences between first half and second half settlements uh, to um, affect this particular cash flow plan. And as you know, we talked about the impact that the change in the tax law had. Folks rushed to pay their I don't know whether rushed is the right word, but they, uh, they decided to pay a full year's taxes back in December of 17, um, and so that would distort our first half 18 collections. Um, so that, that caused some anomalies. But I think this should work itself out into the second half, that this $30 million favorable, um, or property taxes favorable of $7.7 .7 million uh, will likely um, not, not necessarily continue. Uh, when we look at state aid, our second largest source of income, we're very much on target. Um, year to date through August, about uh, two million over, over plan. Uh, in your notes, I've included uh, comparisons of a couple of calculations. Number one, what I used for the May forecast, and then what we're getting from the State Department of Education in what we call our August number two payment. Um, we get two payments each month from the state for our state foundation or our state aid payments. Uh, right now, we're within about $231,000, what we estimated versus what the August number two, two payment has said we should should receive this year, um, and that's on about $353 million. So that, that calculation's spot on as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in this line, we'll also see about $2.5 million worth of casino revenue flow in that... Um, 
that's not included in that number I mentioned. And there may be a million to a million, million and a half of other adjustments that come through uh, foundation payments that aren't included in this cash flow. So we should end up above plan, um, but basically in the, you know, uh, maybe million to two million dollar range by the end of the year. So that's an that's an acceptable variance as far as I'm concerned. So other than that, though, that's um, uh, oh, that that estimate is on, in line with what we're seeing from ODE for now. In terms of all other revenues, uh, the restricted federal grants, there's no activity yet. Property tax allocation, which is the uh, ten and a half and two percent uh, rollback. Uh, that we get from the state, except on the most recent levy where that's now been exempted from that. But in any case, uh, that came in in August, uh, and we had it in the plan for September. So this is a very good example of where we know we're going to get a bullet payment uh, of some sort. Uh, it occurs, could be August, September, October, and so rather than smooth it out and make it look like it's going to come in in three payments, we just pick a month. So in our plan, we pick September and April to get the, the rollback payment. Uh, it'll be plus or minus a month of that. But I do know since we're into September and we've, we've received the payment that we'll be within um, $825,000 uh, favorable to the plan, and that's on about uh, $16 million in revenue. Okay, so that, that will resolve itself next month. Um, all, other, all other revenues, um, tuition fees, investment income, um, we are about two and a half million ahead through August, largely explained by two items, investment income uh, being up by about 1.1 million thus far, and uh, our pilots, our property tax, payments in lieu of taxes, uh, is up about 1.3 million over what uh, the month to month plan would call for. Uh, we'll consistently outpace these two um, because I'm not gonna be overzealous about interest rates and available balances and pilot payments um, those can vary um, uh, when they come in and the dollar amount that they, 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 they come in. So uh, you'll see here, as well as in the forecast, that these will be on the low side in terms of a, of a projection. So we expect these to run, a, run ahead of plan. Um, I would note that if you, uh, in the, um, in the um, discussion and analysis document, you'll see that the um, uh, scale of the graph is in tens of millions of dollars, not hundreds of millions of dollars. So as a source of income, this is um, uh, relatively uh, um, small uh, on a percentage basis. All of our, uh, the last item, other financing sources on the revenue uh, side have to do with transfers in and advances in. Uh, the advances in were planned at 10 and a half million. They've come in now at about 6.7 million. So they're 3.8 million under plan. Um, and you know that's the line where you put ten and a half million in for revenue coming in and ten and a half million for expenses going out. So on a cash flow projection basis, there there's a neutral impact. But then when the actual occurs, you're you're going to get some some variances there. Um, so that that is a true three three point eight million under plan. Our other financing sources line. Uh, I just this year? Uh, the advances? Yeah. Uh, what happens is, uh, by state law, a fund cannot have a negative cash balance at the end of the year. So the general fund is required to fund all the other funds. And so many of the state and federal grants are on a reimbursement basis. So we've incurred expenses, but we've not been reimbursed yet for it. So you get to the end of the year and you look at that and you go, okay, well, we're going to have to advance um, some money to the various funds. So that gets advanced to them. And then in August, we figure it out and we, we bring the monies back after we get reimbursed. The only exception is still the one where you have a cash request that's still in process that you expect to be paid, right? That you don't have to have worry about that deficit, right? That's still the law. Mike does that. Mike's that. not here. I, I yes. don't know. It, it, <laughs> I helped break that law. That's why I was Okay, uh, okay Mr. Jordan, that is correct. <laughs> that yeah. is, you're <laughs> ab absolutely correct. We'll go with that. Um, so now you're more than, you're all the way there at the quorum. I don't know. Okay. The minutes after we finish this. Um, so uh, the other thing in that line item and, and other financing sources, uh, we generally budget about 150000 in that line. But this year uh, we received $2.4 in a refund of prior year fees from the Franklin County Auditor. 
As you might recall, back in fiscal 15, we received a like amount or a similar amount of about 2.1 million. So every um, uh, three years or so, the county auditor uh, looks at his um, real estate assessment fund and determines that there are excess dollars there and decides to make a refund. And we don't know that that will continue and we don't know what the dollar amount is. So that 2.4 million uh, is definitely um, unanticipated and is above our plan. So it, those all net out to about a, a $1.5 million um, favorable year-to-date variance there. So, um, or on, um, three, uh, where are we? Yeah, we're, we're slightly above plan uh, on that line. So we'll see how that, that works out. Um, it should be pretty flat from here on out. On the expenditure side, personnel has started off the year as it, as it ended the year, and that it's running under plan, about 6.2 million or 7% under plan. The key will be what happens in September and October. It's, it's those months where we get um, all of the personnel on board um, and they start receiving a paycheck. Uh, it's, it's in those months that the uh, um, negotiated wage increases uh, take take uh, take effect and are beginning to be paid out. July and August are run out from the previous year uh, because we're um, on what we, call, what we call stretch pay. So you earn it from September to, to June and it gets paid out September through uh, August. So we'll see better in September and then into October whether or not this plan is going to be um, closer than we were last year and get a, get a much, much better picture there. Um, on purchase services, um, actually, let's jump to charter. Charter schools, we call out. Charter schools uh, and their expenses um, are part of purchase services, but we call them out because they represent a pretty significant, almost $200 million line item for us. Uh, they are running on target right now um, at about 233000 under plan. The, uh, keep in mind, too, that things like charter school and state aid were still running on last year's numbers. So it, about October, November, when we get the new numbers in, then we'll see a better picture of not only what kind of state foundation monies we'll have, but what kind of enrollment issues there are out there that will either increase or decrease those charter school deductions. But for now, it, we're, we're on plan through July and, and August. Um, as we get into purchase services, purchase services and supplies and material were two items that ran under plan and have always been uh, a topic of conversation. Uh, it's these uh, favorable variances, and in this case, under plan is a favorable variance. Uh, it's these variances that have been a topic of conversation at numerous uh, finance committee meetings, and it's this variance that I've taken into account at least part of it. What we did is we looked back at the historical variances and took about half of that variance. So if you're typically running at, say, 20 percent uh, under the appropriation, uh, we would take about 10 percent of that and say, okay, let's, let's factor that out. Um, uh, from our appropriation for an estimate for cash flow. So we'll see how that works uh, relative to the plan, see, how, see if that uh, gets us a little bit, a little bit closer. Um, purchase services, though, are under plan, about $280,000 uh, through, through um, August, and we have reduced them about 1.4% uh, about versus the appropriation to get to this adjusted plan. Um, supplies and materials, uh, dollar amount very small, 75000 under plan. So both of those lines look a lot better graphically than they did last year so far. So, so far so good. Um, and we will, you know, we'll keep an eye on the revised budgets to see if there's any movement uh, between lines that would cause this plan to, um, you know, not be true to form. Uh, capital outlay, we, we just simply projected it at 100% of the budget, uh, the appropriation amount. Um, and there's about, uh, I think, a, a little over a million dollars in carry forward or orders, purchase orders that were issued last year that will carry over to this year. So uh, to be honest, uh, if those all get expended but we don't expend all of our original appropriation, then that's how you end up at 100% of your appropriation. Uh, mathematically. Uh, but as you can see right now, we had a pretty big uh, payout in, in August, and so we are running um, uh, over plan on that line item right now. 
I think we're just going to have to watch this month to month to see see where that's headed. And again, we'll watch the revised appropriation to see if there are any increases or decreases there that would affect how much can ultimately be expended in that line. Uh, debt service, uh, no activity yet. Again, that's really two bullets. We make a, our the vast majority of our debt service payment on December 1 of each year, and then we have some interest payments uh, due in June. So uh, we're usually spot on on this one, <laughs> not only in timing but in dollar amount because those are already predetermined. Other objects are primarily are cons uh, uh, comprised of county auditor and treasurer's fees. As I said, we receive settlement, um, and uh, uh, those, those are, are in now. Um, Interestingly enough, as I look at the graph, we planned on the fees to be deducted in August, but as you, you know, that was, never mind, that was property. That was um, the property tax allocation. Anyway, we're, we hit the month and we hit the amount. Um, it's, we, uh, 3.5 million of the three and a half, six million total received here is for those, those fees, and we're on plan at about 312,000 favorable, meaning under plan. So uh, other financing sources, again, that's the transfer out and advances out. Um, it's currently showing uh, a two million unfavorable as in over plan um, variance. But as you'll see, we expected to do our transfers out in September, uh, but we executed those in August. So that, that should resolve itself there. That's strictly timing. So all in all, I think, um, I often have said that I, I think it would be better to look at school finances uh, on a quarterly basis um, because of these kinds of variances that occur just one month, one way or the other. Uh, so I think by the time we get to the end of September, um, a lot of this will work itself out, um, especially that large revenue variance will, will resolve itself and we'll be back on plan. So that's it for July and August to get us up okay. to date. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the monthly financial? So um, we may not have anything right now for members, especially with some of our newer members. There's a lot to sort of process as we sort of dive into this sort of monster that is school funding and how we handle it here and how we uh, try to be transparent and accountable and, and, and air this out and talk about it. So if you have any questions and things come to mind, just feel free to email Stan. <laughs> and uh, he'll be able to help you out. Uh, but there, there, there's a lot to this, and, and you, know, you know, there's a lot of things that he had talked about that sometimes works its way out through the year. And just other questions that you may have, feel free, please, you know, do you stand as a resource? He's very helpful. <laughs> and what we tried to do when we started the Finance Committee, um, I came and did a presentation, and everyone listened intently, but then it, you kind of lose that. So there was a request made that they said, you know what you just said? Could you write that down? Which led to this management discussion, management discussion mm -hmm. and analysis section. So I do um, the most detail of my explanation there. And then when we get here, it's not just highlights, but it's not, I don't read the MDNA to you. Then when I get to the board, I try and do highlights because, well, the board has a tendency to, for me, they want me to be shorter in my presentation than longer. And so we, so we go from very detailed in terms of the written document to a, a, a reasonably detailed discussion here to highlights with the board. And just so you know, that's how that works. So um, it's, it's best to, if you can, just read the document and then that'll maybe answer your questions. So Thank that's, you. That's it. All right. So we now have a quorum. So we can reflect that with the members. Now let's uh, just really quickly then take a look at the the minutes from the previous meeting. And if I can get a motion to approve those minutes. Approved minutes. All right. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. Minutes are approved. All right. So let's keep on moving forward. And again, sorry to be hasty, but we uh, sort of have a compact day today and we have to... Didn't want to let you. We have superintendent yeah. interview. Okay, yeah. the interview yeah. tonight. So, we'll move on now to the five-year forecast presentation. Stan Scott, the floor is still yours. Okay, and it's up. Great. Um, I don't need that anymore. Okay, a um, couple of things. One, you should have a handout. Um, of the presentation. Uh, I think it's the four up, if I'm not mistaken, what I call four up. 
there's that. And then you will have before you um, two forecasts, actually. One that's headed up uh, no adjustment for historical spending pattern, and the other one headed up adjusted for historical spending pattern. Um, and I'll get into those for your consideration. I will have a recommendation which one we ultimately use, but I wanted to give you that, that information uh, for your consideration. As always, I start this off with some explanation and discussion about uh, or introduction to a forecast. Um, and th this is, I used this quote last year and I continue to use it because I think it's, it's applicable that forecasting is difficult especially if it's about the future. I thought that was um, uh, pretty appropriate because sometimes we think that the forecast now is cast in stone and in fact the forecast is pretty much stale the minute I put it on paper. Um, things, can, things can change pretty rapidly. We have a practice here of preparing the forecast uh, in August so that we present it to the for Finance Committee in September and then it's formally adopted in October. Um, a lot of things could happen during that time period that might have, uh, might affect the uh, the forecast. Uh, there are also a lot of things that will be coming up in the very near future that will impact this forecast. So it's really intended to be a snapshot in time. Uh, this is our legal requirement, as uh, Mr. Purdy mentioned earlier. We do this twice uh, a year. We uh, adopt the October forecast, which is technically our forecast, and then in May we adopt technically what's called an update to the forecast. I understand the statute has changed that we'll be able to file the forecast at the end of November instead of October. I don't know whether that's effective immediately or next year. It really doesn't have any impact on us or for me. My recommendation is to continue with our current pattern because that's been our practice. Uh, I believe the reason for the extension to November was to allow districts to consider the impact or include the impact of a levy that might pass in November. Uh, as you can recall back when 2016 when we had a levy on the ballot, uh, when we did our October forecast, uh, it, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, include any of the revenue from that levy because it had not passed yet. And so the forecast looked reasonably abysmal. Uh, the levy passed. And then I came back in December of 16 and presented to the board a revised or updated uh, forecast. Um, and one might say, well, that's kind of out of sync. But in fact, I think there is a requirement that if we have a significant change, and I believe that probably is in the 10% range, if something happens that impacts your, your forecast by 10%, you need to file a revised forecast. So that's what we did in December. This new law would allow us then, if we had a levy on in November, to delay uh, passage of the, the forecast until we knew whether or not that uh, levy had passed. So from a practical standpoint, we'd be preparing the forecast in two versions, one with, one without, wait for the November election, then do the presentation and move on. Uh, similar to looking at this with and without this expenditure pattern adjustment, we just do two different versions. So anyway, um, <coughs> the ODE gives you a lot of information on how to, how to read a forecast. It reminds you that um, it's a snapshot of today, trying to look forward. And the further out you go, as you know, with any forecast, the, the riskier uh, it becomes and the more you're going to deviate in terms of actual from your forecast. Um, they do note in, the, in, the, in this document that uh, while there's a variety of events that will impact the later years, they specifically call out state budgets. And in our particular case, our experience with state budgets has been then less than um, enjoyable. And we have a new state biennial budget coming up this spring. Uh, depending, up, I, I don't think it matters who the governor is. It's just that we have a new governor. And they, he will get uh, so, some time leeway on preparing his version of the budget. So that will be a little bit later. So we won't know much about the state budget till March. So if you can imagine, we're waiting till March to get that information. And I'm trying to prepare a forecast to give to this committee in April for the board in May, and you know, over 45% of our, our revenue comes from the state. We know, won't know exactly what that looks like until March. Um, so, and that's just the governor's budget. It doesn't have to be adopted until the end of June. So we'll be in that state of limbo um, uh, next, next spring. Um, just to remind you, there are, there are many variables in the forecast that are difficult to predict. Um, a lot of them are outside of our control, and um, all that uncertainty leads to uh, the fact that this forecast will vary over time. 
So let's begin to look at the forecast. Uh, since our May forecast, um, we now have the actual results for FY18, and I, I only have one line here on this one, but it does, it does mean a lot. Um, as you know, we had about a $50 million favorable variance, um, so it affects the base uh, from which we begin our projections, so revenue projections would be up, expenditure projections somewhat down in the area of uh, primarily in terms of personnel because we do a, a kind of a last year, then predict changes and, and move forward. Um, Non-personnel budgeting, not so much uh, did the results have an impact because we had that five-year budget. Um, so, uh, but that, that's a big thing when we get the final results and plug them in and it can shift the lines a bit. On the revenue side, most notable, I'll call it out, and that is we we're, we're remain on the cap and that cap growth is, is plugged in at 4%. Um, we don't know what they're going to do. Uh, we're going to make the assumption that what they did in the past, uh, they'll continue to do in the future. Uh, a budget or two ago, that wasn't such a great assumption, uh, but it's the best we've got to go with. On the expenditure side, uh, we are going to, or I will have, I have prepared, and I will share with you the impact of, of implementing uh, some adjustment for these historical spending platter, patterns. So if we begin to look at revenues, um, and, and not uh, going through every one of the of the dollar amounts, but you can see, and I, I like to show this graphically so you can see whether or not there are any anomalies for uh, uh, versus a, a long-term trend in these revenue <coughs> items. Keep in mind that the forecast includes three years of actual, which in this case is fiscal year 16, 17, and 18, and five years of, of forecast, the current fiscal year 19, and then uh, on out to fiscal 23. I add three more fiscal years beyond that. Um, primarily because this should be a long-term financial planning tool and um, we have to plan around, I'll say it, levy cycles. Um, most school districts uh, in the state of Ohio, a typical cycle would be four years. Often that's tied to presidential elections. That's kind of a practice that's out there. You'll see variances from that. but when we, just because we need to look at, at four-year chunks in time, um, a five-year forecast doesn't get you to the next set of events that you'll have to address uh, as, a, as a committee and as a district and the board. So I like to look out a little bit longer to show you just what's around the horizon, potentially, if trends and patterns that we see in this forecast continue continue out a bit. On property taxes, um, it's about $507 million in, in 2019, growing to $533 million in 23, and then we project it out to about $552 million in, in 26. Again, no new levies are, are allowed to be contemplated uh, in this forecast. That's a, um, a growth rate for projection of about 1.23 percent. So it's pretty small growth in, in, in property taxes. A lot of people believe, well, there's triennial updates and reappraisals, and boy, property values, if they go up, you're going to get a whole lot of money. That is absolutely just patently false. Um, House Bill 920 precludes that from happening, except on inside millage. Um, and inside millage is, is you know, maybe 10 percent of our overall, our overall millage. But what it does in House Bill 920 is, as property values go up, uh, the tax rate is reduced so that, that the two multipliers, A times B, equals the same tax collection, C. Not everybody, they think I'm crazy when I say that because everybody looks at their own tax bill. And quite often some people's tax bill goes up and some people's tax bill goes down. Because House Bill 920 is, uh, is applied across the entire duplicate. And they set the rate across the entire duplicate. So if property tax values go up 10%, uh, the rate is reduced proportionally so that, that it, it Overall, uh, when you multiply all the values times this one set rate, you get the same dollar amount. Well, if your property value goes up 15%, but your rate only goes down as if it went up 10%, well, you're going to get a larger tax bill. There'll be a, a burden shift. And if your property value only increases at 5%, well, your rate went, went down as if it went up 10%. So you're going to pay less. And typically, the people you hear from are the people whose bill went up, not the people who went down. They don't. They might not understand why that, that happened. And folks go, well, that doesn't, 
that doesn't happen. Well, yes, in fact, it does. Um, historically, we have two, um, uh, <coughs> we have a division of property, R1 and R2, residential, agricultural, and commercial, industrial, for that very fact. I can't remember when it was state issue one, don't know what year it was. It was when I, during my lifetime as a treasurer, which now, uh, as of July 1, hit 40 years. Um, but during that lifetime, the duplicate was together. And due to inflation, commercial industrial was not growing as rapidly as residential. And what was happening was there was a tax burden shift from commercial industrial over to residential. Um, and it, that, because of House Bill 920. And so residential was growing at, say, 15%, but overall everything was going up 10%, and commercial was only going up 5 so commercial paid less. Resident. So we split the two. We have two different reduction factors, two different calculations, so that residential behaves on its own, commercial industrial behaves on its own. But anyway, that's why the, that's why the minimal to no growth. In the, in the uh, 16, 17, and 18 fiscal years, you see that spike. That's called a new levy. It's voted on in 16, which is November of 16, which is um, in the middle of the 17 fiscal year. So we get one collection period in 17, and we get two collection periods of the new tax in 18. And so from 18 forward, that pretty much represents the benchmark from which we work in terms of property taxes. Ma yes, sir. With respect to House Bill 920, um, and I don't want to get into any discussion about um, abatements in general, but Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, am I right that new development, mostly commercial or industrial, um, will add to the tax duplicates and, and provide additional funds as part of the property tax, Yes. Uh, except to the extent that it's abated. abated? Right. And then we'll see it later. That's correct. That's correct. And and um, you'll you often hear about border revision and border tax appeals issues, um, and that which does not get converted into pilots, where we settle and we, we get direct payments and it doesn't appear to, to come through the regular uh, property tax um, uh, levy and collection process. Um, the net result of border revision and border tax appeals does can result in an increase in property taxes. So at some point in time, if you want to talk about the timing, especially since we went through a reappraisal last year, and the timing of, of when you want to go down and complain about your value, do you want to complain before or after the duplicate is set to actually impact your own tax bill? Um, there is a time to do that. Um, and it was made fairly easy uh, by the county auditor this past year. They had those community meetings that come on down and have a talk and you know, present whatever edifice you got and we'll adjust your, your value. And everybody thought, this is great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce my taxes. Well, that was before the duplicate was set. So it was before that one of the multipliers was set in that A times B equals C. So all that did was kind of realign everything. Now, you didn't get the full impact of that valuation decrease because your lower value, if it was only one property, lower value meant that the, that the rate didn't come down as much. Um, I know some of my friends said, were you going to complain about your value? And I said, well, not before the duplicate set. Because after the duplicate set and the rate is set, and you go to the border revision, if you get a reduction in your value, it's times that rate. That rate doesn't change, so your value goes down and it's times that rate. That's why, and now we're going to talk about legislation, why, we're, why we have testified against a piece of legislation that's making it onerous, difficult, if not impossible, for us to file claims at the Board of Revision to protect our duplicate. We want to make sure, because every dollar in reduced value at the Board of Revision means we lose dollars here directly. There is no adjustment. Later on, that gets factored in when they do the next year, perhaps, but the first year, it's a, it's a direct dollar loss or dollar gain. Um, in that case. So, yes, you are correct. Um, right. And, and I, I should have added one thing, which is that Columbus City Schools has virtually no say in those matters. <coughs> so that's property taxes. Uh, our second largest uh, source of revenue, state revenue. Um, again, um, just pretty much on a trend line. The dotted line on all these graphs is a, is a trend line. Uh, based upon the uh, forecast dollars. So you can see uh, 
the backward projection and forward projection of that trend for this five-year period within the forecast. State revenue grows from three. Uh, 355 million in 19 to about 414 million in 23 and to uh, 464 million in 26. Um, the precise math is that's an annual growth rate of 3.87 percent. There are some items that are subject to the cap, some that aren't. Uh, so if we don't grow the ones that aren't subject to the cap, you get a little bit less than 4 percent. But ostensibly, this is a 4 percent growth rate on that. The property tax allocation, again, the uh, homestead and rollback. Um, very flat, um, and you'll go, well, Stan, you're crazy. Look at your own graph. That doesn't seem to fit. 16, 17, and 18 represented the phasing out of the state's reimbursement on personal property tax. Uh, as of 19, it's gone, and after this, we don't get any more. It was sizable. It was in the millions of dollars that we received. Um, and so that's, that's now gone. Uh, typically, this is just, it, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much flat. The new levy is not subject to the rollback so we don't receive money from the state on it. Our taxpayers pay the, the full boat uh, for any new levy. That's projected to basically be in the $34, $35 million range throughout this forecast and into the future. We're looking at all other revenues. Again, uh, those payment in lieu of taxes and investment income, we're very conservative. I told you we factored in. We don't want to count our chickens before our eggs are hatched. Is that the right way to put that? So we, we tend to let investment income estimates decline over time and, and pilots to decline over time. And that uh, explains why we go from $38 million in 2019 to $32 million in 23, down to $29 million in 26. Again, over this time period, it's not a large dollar amount because we're dealing with $30 million here. But it is a, de it is a, it is a decline over time. Um, that's one area where we can see some favorable pickup in, in revenues. Total revenues, uh, $935 million in 19 to just under $1 billion in 23 to just over $1.1 or just under $1.1 billion uh, in 2026. That's an annual growth rate of about 2.1 percent overall, and you can see how that trends. Again, the new levy in 16, 17, 18 sticks out in this graph. Moving on to expenditures. This is where the historical spending percentage adjustment kicks in. And <clears throat> what I do here is I've got no adjustment and adjustment, just show you what the numbers are and what the differences are and what they accumulate over this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight year period. So you can see that personnel, it's a very large number, very small adjustment. Um, quite frankly, you'd say, well, why did you even do it? Well, it's. I just wanted to be consistent. I want to look at it and say, you know, based on our original appropriation, we tend to be under that a bit. So let's let's factor that in. Over this time period, we pull out about 12.6 million out of the uh, out of the forecast. If we would uh, actually for the eight-year period for the forecast, it's about um, three, four, uh, maybe. Eight million that we pull out of the out of the forecast if we use the adjusted numbers. And quite, I'll tell you right now, I'm in favor of using the adjusted numbers for the for the forecast. Um, huh? Well, so simply because we've talked about running under budget, mm -hmm. we looked historically, and I took a percentage of that. And said, well, let's see if we can't tweak our forecasts and our and our cash flow planning a bit to get closer to action. So I didn't get the whole thing out. I took a portion out. And this is a, just a small portion to, to do that, to adjust it downward. Um, I just think we have this pattern of uh, underspending the, the, the budget. And it, it could be, you know, just be a little bit closer picture than what the future looks like than to have it in. This isn't monumental, but mm -hmm. it, it is a tweak that I think we'd be okay making. We have questions or anything like on this part? And we've looked back to 2013 when we when we looked at this pattern. So we've and again, as as questions come, please feel free to email Stan as we go forward. Sure. <laughs> uh, and you'll see in our graphs here. You know, I give you the graphs in paper, but unless mm -hmm. you hold them up the light, you'll never see it. You won't even see it here. There, and I feel like I'm going to be at the eye doctor's appointment. Here's with no adjustment, and here's with adjustment. One, two. <laughs> it, it's we're talking about six hundred million dollars, and it's it's it doesn't move the line 
Uh, but it does, you know, pull out seven, eight, ten million dollars out of the out of the forecast. Um, it just gets us a little bit closer. Let's look at non-personnel and all other. I lump everything together here. Um, as you can see here, it's a little bit more significant. Um, we're looking at uh, 5, 10, 15, uh, 32, probably about $35 million um, in the forecast or a little over $50 million for this eight-year time period if we use the adjusted numbers. Again, graphically, this one you can actually see a little bit. There's with um, no adjustment, and there's with the adjusted. So, and that's no. just taking into effect tightening up our forecasting. Yeah, and, and saying, look, we, we typically use the appropriation as a basis and our budgets as a basis for forecasting. If we typically underspend them, let's, let's change the forecast and, and account for that. Um, if you recall when we went into our budget reductions mm -hmm. um, and we looked out, um, I think it was about five years. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm trying to remember what the dollar amount was, but we had this hundred, several hundred million dollar deficit that we were going to address. And before we started to look at reductions, I said, well, we know we're going to have favorable variances. So we took that off mm -hmm. the table immediately in our discussions and said, we're going to let time take care of that rather than go and, and try and find what, whatever that number was. It was about 30, I want to say about $30 million that we pulled off the table right away and said, we're going to have that in favorable variances anyway, so let, we don't need to do anything for that. Um, that's doing kind of partially this. Um, I, I want to say incorporating a portion of that variance into our forecast already, becoming less conservative. Um, I, wouldn't, I would by no means say that we're aggressive in our forecasting. I still think we'll have favorable variances, even with this adjustment, but I wanted to throw it out to the committee. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, ultimately, the one number we're going to look at and what the impact it is. Now, is this going to have an impact on our you know, personnel budgets and our non-personnel budgets and the planning that's going on, or is this just your... Like, no, I think we'll still, we'll, still our, we'll still mm -hmm. do our planning mm -hmm. that way, um, but when we get to this more cash flow mm -hmm. consideration, We'll want to make some, some modifications. And then, as we've talked before, we, we don't want this adjustment to negatively impact the budgeting aspect of things because mm -hmm. we don't want budget managers to think they're going to get into a use it or lose it. There are questions to be asked about why are we under budget, but we need to work that through the process. Because um, we know we're not going to be at 100% per, you know, right precision on target every time, but I do want to, where we can tweak it, let's go ahead and, and tweak it and, and make the forecast and our month-to-month -month spending plan more of a cash flow document, this being more of a kind of a behavioral planning document. Mm -hmm. um, so we still have to ask a lot of questions of, of our budget managers when we look at their budgets over time and say, you said this, but you, you spent this. Does this mean you did or did not do something you wanted to do? Did you do it more efficiently? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's that explanation? Um, total expenditures, as you can see, when you combine the two, overall, if we go with the adjusted, um, we get to pull about $63 million out of the um, uh, eight-year plan. And um, I should have done this math ahead of time. That's 13. Uh, about $24, 25000000 out of the forecast. So the key here, then, is um, total expenditures uh, adjusted and not adjusted. You can't see it. I've got it there, and, but um, it's very hard to discern. So in summary, what do we want to look at? Um, this is what it looks like, revenue and expenditures, and the uh, uh, excess of revenue over or under uh, expenditures. Uh, if we don't include the expenditure adjustment, it looks like that. If we do include the expenditure, it, it shows up a lot better on my small screen when I'm real close to it. So it's, it's, <laughs> you, really, you really can't see it. But here's where the dramatic impact comes into play. And this is what we all look at. It's the ending cash balance. Um, you can see 16, 17, 18, and 19, we planned on building cash balance, and it grows. In 20, um, you can see that the, um, uh, we're probably going to uh, begin to uh, be kind of will be flat, and then in 21 we're going to uh, 
um, you, know, you can see that that cash balance beginning to 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 fall. So it's just a matter of which trajectory do you think is more reasonable? Um, you know, in one case, if we don't make the expenditure adjustment, uh, we're looking at a deficit of 509 million and 26, um, or 446 if you take it into account. For our forecast period, which ends in 23, the forecast is either going to show 13 million negative in, in uh, 23 or uh, 23 million positive in 23. That's that, uh, what is it, $36 million shift. Just wanted to let you know that that's the impact having, uh, that, that, that taking some of this expenditure pattern into effect would have. Um, I think it's perfectly fine to include the expenditure adjustment. Um, you're going to have a forecast that has positive balances throughout. But keep in mind that blue dotted line. That blue dotted line is 30 days cash close to 90 to, uh, 90 to $100 million. I think it worked out to be about $91, $92 million. That's where we should be um, targeting in terms of trying to maintain our cash balance at or above that level. You can see that the minute you, you dip below it, it's, it's, not, uh, it, it's a pretty good indicator that there's trouble uh, in the very near future. I think graphically you look at, at at two things um, when, you, when you plot cash balances. When that line begins to turn down, which is basically back in 2020, it, it begins to turn down. Uh, and when you drop below uh, your 30-day cash, um, those are both leading indicators of, of the need to do something. You have two choices. You increase revenue, you decrease expenditure. Yeah, three choices. My, my, Bad. You, you decrease revenue, you uh, increase revenue, decrease expenditures, or do a combination of the two of them. And as you know, what we did, if you look at this forecast, it, it was negative out there. But we went through the expenditure reductions, and we had favorable results for 18. Those two factors led to this five-year period being positive, if you assume the, the make the expenditure adjustment, we're pretty much right at zero. So we did what we're supposed to, it worked. But I don't work five years at a time and I don't work one levy plan at a time. So I'm gonna add a couple other numbers here. I'm gonna add numbers for fiscal year 25, the 307 and the 253. Don't care which one you use at this point, just know that they're a lot bigger than, than 23 million favorable. Um, and I do that because our November levy that we passed in, in calendar year 16, November of 16, uh, th that was intended to fund f typically four fiscal years. Now you, you voted for it in the middle of 17, so you get a half a year collection. So it's really not intended to fund 17 at all. Um, if you wait to vote in the November of the fiscal year that you face a deficit, your millage is essentially double your deficit. You just, that's, that's not workable. So you vote in 16 to cover 18 through 21. That means the next levy, whenever we have it, needs to cover 22, 23, 24, and 25. And at that point, if nothing changes and the picture still looks the same, you'll be looking at trying to fund a 250 to $300 million deficit with that next levy. Now I have an interactive worksheet for levy planning. Don't know that you want to do that in this committee, but we have looked at that administratively to see. And we, we do watch this um, such that we have a pretty good idea of, of, of millage impact when you get out there because you do have to manage to that. So managing to a deficit number that you have to cover is essentially the same. Just so you know, if you ever wanted to do the math, a mill here generates about $10 million now. So I looked at that. So there's your October forecast. So you, you had a choice. Um, I prefer the adjusted one, but I'll take the committee's recommendation. Um, and then, but what I'm concerned about are those two numbers. Uh, we can't address that today, but that's what I keep, not even in the back of my mind, that's in the forefront of my mind as I look at a forecast, and that's why I go out an additional three years. So I have an idea of what's coming down the pike, because my board does not like surprises. So they don't want to look at this, and then next year have a, uh, 
you know, $100 million deficit roll into the picture that they didn't know was coming. That's it. You have three and a half minutes for all your questions. <laughs> questions, email stand. No. <laughs> Let's try to do it. And, and again, though. just so you know, we will. Um, uh, I think I think if you wanted to, and it's up to the committee. There was another committee meeting scheduled this month. I thought we reserved the date in later September. I'd have to look at the calendar. I thought we did just in case. Um, um, I would be in favor of us sort of taking a look at this material and these recommendations and, and coming back and maybe making that. If that would be okay with everyone, just to kind of... I'll look at that date. If it's mm -hmm. not on the calendar, I'll, I'll figure out what that should have been and send it out to everybody. But this gets presented to the board, uh, the first board meeting in um, October, mm -hmm. which I think is October 2nd. It's right up there. That's why I put it up there. October 2nd, uh, they get a chance to mull it over, and um, uh, then they'll adopt it on the 16th. Um, I will likely write something up and send it to the board ahead of time. Again, nobody likes surprises. And, We'll, we'll let the board, after the committee, you know, I don't know if you're ready to pick or not, but I need to know from you which one you'd like me to to roll with. What do, what do we think? Just, yeah, just, mm -hmm. yeah, same thing. You're taking yeah. some of the arrows, arrows, arrows out that you know are already embedded. Yeah. yeah. You know. Normalizing, I guess I would say. Yep. Eric, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I just make sense. Okay. John, Amy, April, any thoughts on this? Well, I, I am in favor of it as well. Okay. So, good. you know, I, I do think we, we've been continuing to try to tighten up things, understand our budget, what's the behavior behind it. Like you said, this isn't going to be driving sort of things that we already knew and on what we're going to be doing in our upcoming budgets. Uh, it is sort of that, that back end of it. But let's just keep an eye on it. I know we've been continuing to look at the supplies and materials. has always been an item that we've been sort of honing in on. Please continue to work on that. Uh, this is the first meeting. There's a lot of stuff for a lot of folks here. Um, you know, just use this time to digest this. You know, I, I do think that we should go with those adjusted numbers as well. Um, you know, I, I think we've been very prudent in trying to really understand what our budget does and, and what it is that we have available. So, um, and, and looking out. So I, I'm in favor of that as well. Um, unfortunately, due to the lack of timing that we have on our part right now, and we do have another date scheduled. Maybe we can get an email out uh, for just to give committee members time to, to take a look at this and our ex-officio members as well to ask questions internally, ask questions from Stan and myself. You know, feel free to copy me as well. I'm just playing uh, or anyone else. Um, but, um, you know, any questions that you may have uh, on this as we move forward with this document that we'll have to have ready in October. All right. That good with everyone? Cool. So real quick, let's do the budget uh, timeline real quick. 15 seconds. It's yeah. just, um, we just put together the things that we talked about the last meeting when we were going to have some um, discussion and presentations sure. on there. You'll see board meeting dates as a tentative mm -hmm. once we get into the second half of the fiscal year because you won't set those dates until the organizational meeting. Sure. So that's why there's a... So I know we've been... follows the same <laughs> format as it does now. But we've just, been sort of you know working on the non-personnel budget for a long time now. Personnel budget is new. Our capital budgets are sort of looking back and looking forward briefly, uh, but what should we expect looking at a personnel budget this committee? Are we looking at some recommendations, or are we going to try to toy around with we're that? We're going to present something mm -hmm. that in October okay. to get, have the committee to respond to. Sure. Um, no, stands back. We're going to kind of talk through that. We're going to yeah. look through what I've an idea that I've come up with, um, and then we can kind of put that forward for you to respond to. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, with that, I do hate to be really brief about one, this. Time. One Please. quick final comment. Mm -hmm. Mike's not here, but uh, he's very excited about this. Just to let you know, uh, those of you who were around on the committee when we talked about our transparency site, we talked about the state site. Our, our, um, uh, Tyler acquired uh, Socrata. Uh, they have a whole new site. Uh, we're going to we're going to switch to that site in the very near future. Um, there is a, a lot of it's it's even bigger and better in terms of the presentation of our data uh, in, in live uh, format. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that we're going to, uh, Mike and I are going to meet with other folks in the, in the, in the district to say, look, you, we may want to um, be able to create things on that site mm -hmm. that we can embed in our own, our own uh, 
website. For instance, you talk about Operation Fix It and wanted a live update to our expenditures and how things mm -hmm. are going. We, we could on our own be able to build that with the live data, embed a graph or a chart or something. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. We're really excited about it. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the, it, same, same, there's no cost differential uh, in, in that regard. And uh, we're, we're working diligently to get that enhanced. So okay. we're really excited about that. On the other hand, the state sites kind of yeah, fell through. They, they still haven't posted Josh our Mandel's FY16 site. Yeah. data. Oh, my gosh. All right. so. Well, again, appreciate that. Sure. Again, thank you. If we do have questions and I'm, and I'm you know, looking at our ex officios, as well, because a lot of these adjustments do come from. You know, I see non-personnel adjustments. I see that coming, you know, from law of the end on the on the superintendent's end. But when you talk about personnel, kind of gets in your lanes a little bit. So I want you guys to look at it. Just double check. I know we're just talking about sort of, you know, tightening things up. But I do want you guys to look at it. If you have any questions, please feel free to, you know, use myself and email Stan. All right. Good. All right. With that, look for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Same sign, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, and I apologize for the busy meeting.